We're good. Okay, we're good. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the February 27th meeting of the Edgemont School District Board of Education. Tonight's agenda items are from the February 12th meeting that was postponed due to inclement weather. Uh, may I have a motion to return to public session? First Grace, second Nilesh. Okay, I would like to start by asking our district clerk, Jennifer Massey, to administer the oath of allegiance to our deputy district clerk, Richard McCormick. Please raise your right hand or say. I, Richard McCormick, hereby pledge and declare that I support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York. And that will be to discharge the duties of the position of deputy district clerk of the Edmont Board of Education for the death of my. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so second order of business is approval of the January 18th, 2024 meeting minutes. May I have a motion? First, Noreen, second, Doya. Any questions or corrections? All in favor? Motion passes. All right, next. Uh, may I have a motion to accept the treasurer's report for January 2024? First, Grace. Second, Heather. Any questions or concerns? All right, all in favor? Motion passes. Excellent. Uh, next is recognition of community. Uh, Dr. Hamilton? Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, as part of the recognition of community, I'd like to uh, just speak in reference to one of the resolutions that is on our agenda this evening. I am thrilled to provide an enthusiastic recommendation for Dr. Amy Moselli as the Director of Human Resources for your consideration this evening. After an extensive search and rigorous interview process, it is abundantly clear that Dr. Moselli stands out as an exceptional candidate who possesses the unique combination of skills 
ex and experience uh, and the vision necessary to excel in this critical role. Throughout the selection process, Dr. Moselli consistently impressed the hiring committee with her in-depth knowledge, innovative ideas, and strategic thinking in the field of human resources. Her extensive experience in the district and her familiarity with practices and procedures, coupled with her advanced academic background, including a doctorate, provided a solid foundation for her impressive insights and solution-oriented approach to addressing complex organizational challenges. Dr. Moselli's passion for fostering an inclusive and supportive workplace culture was evident in her responses during the interview process. She articulated a clear commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and demonstrated a keen understanding of how these principles are essential for driving organizational success and employee engagement. Her track record for implemented effective diversity and inclusion, inclusion, inclusion initiatives in previous roles speak to her ability to create environments where all employees feel valued, respected, and empowered to contribute their best. One of Dr. Moselli's greatest strengths is her ability to develop and implement strategic HR initiatives that align with broader organizational goals. She impressed the hiring committee with her comprehensive understanding of the link between HR practices and organizational performance, as well as her demonstrated ability to leverage data and analytics to drive informed decision-making. Dr. Moselli's strategic mindset and forward-thinking approach position her as a valuable partner in driving organizational growth and success. Moreover, Dr. Moselli's leadership style embodies the qualities of empathy, integrity, and accountability. She is known for her strong interpersonal skills, her ability to build trust and rapport with colleagues at all levels, and her commitment to fostering a collaborative and supportive work environment. Dr. Moselli leads by example, consistently modeling the values of professionalism, transparency and ethical conduct that are essential for building a culture of integrity and trust within our organization. In conclusion, I have the utmost confidence that Dr. Amy Moselli will excel in this role as Director of Human Resources for Edgemont. Her impressive qualifications combined with her passion for HR excellence, strategic acumen and exemplary leadership qualities make her an ideal fit for this critical position. I am confident that she will make a significant and positive impact in this role. And I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly endorse our candidacy. We also want to later in our agenda, I'll ask um, if Michelle Ring will come to the podium and share a, ref a few reflections on one of our retirees. But before we get to that, as we contemplate this resolution for this evening, I do want the board to know that the hiring committee was again completely unanimous on this recommendation that's on the agenda for this evening. So if I may, um, Michelle, if you would come forward at this time. Joe, please. Can I just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just two seconds. Um, because I, um, in my capacity on, oh, I never do that. <laughs> um, I just, I didn't want to not be heard, but um, I, in my, capacity as a member of the policy committee and also the communications committee, both of which intersect with the DIB committee. I have been the pleasure of working with Amy extensively, and I can say that there is nothing she can't do. She is a tremendous asset to this district. Um, she is so committed, and uh, I'll share on a personal, she, she spent much of her um, break this past week assembling these incredible new presentation boards for the science scholars program, which has nothing to do with any of those things <laughs> with which I have been working her with her on. So I just want to congratulate you, Amy, and also the district because we have received such a tremendous gain in, in, in giving her this role. So thank you. Sorry. Good evening. <clears throat> Can you all take a moment to think back 47 years ago? Where were you and what I wasn't you? here. About to be <laughs> I definitely wasn't. <laughs> For one of our beloved teachers, 47 years ago was the start of a six year teaching adventure in Colorado. <laughs> then, 10 unforgettable years overseas teaching with his wife in Germany. 
Following that was two enriching years in teaching in New York City at Dalton. And finally, finishing an incredible 29 year journey right here in Edgemont. Now the time has come to bid farewell. While I've only known and had the great measure, sorry, great pleasure of getting to know this person for two years, it is with profound gratitude and deep emotion that I stand here today to honor the remarkable career of Mr. Peter Corey, a true icon of our Greenville community. Many in our field would not last 47 years, but Mr. Corey sure did. And after all these years of teaching, he finally has realized that he's measured up enough memories to fill a periodic table of retirement bliss. As Mr. Corey prepares to embark on his well-deserved retirement, it's only fitting that we reflect on the impact that he has made on generations of students and colleagues alike. His supervisor at the Gopingen Elementary School in Germany stated that his skills in teaching were only surpassed by his knowledge of subject matter. In 1993, Mr. Corey's supervisor at the Dalton School in New York City described him as an exceptional individual who is committed to his students and their learning. He provides a responsive and expressive environment that is filled with student work. In 1994, Mr. Corey arrived at Greenville School, interviewed and was recommended by his principal at the time, Risa Zaidi, as an exceptional individual with years of experience and expertise in teaching, the outdoors, and technology. As you can see from his early days to his most recent days as a sixth grade teacher, Mr. Corey has consistently demonstrated a commitment to his students' learning and a dedication to excellence that is truly unparalleled. Maria, a colleague who has the privilege of working alongside with Mr. Corey for the past four years, beautifully captures his essence as a humble, intelligent gentleman who mirrors, whose mere presence brightens our days. She speaks of his old school values, his unwavering dedication to instilling respect and manners in his students, and the daily laughter he brings to our hallways with his simple yet endearing gestures has been a source of joy and camaraderie for us all. Laura, who joined our school community from Sealy Place in 2018, shares her heartfelt appreciation for the kindness and warmth that Mr. Corey extended to her from the moment she arrived. His welcoming presence at the copy machine each morning served as a beacon of light, setting the tone for positivity and camaraderie with his, within our midst. Maureen echoes the sentiments of many when she describes Mr. Corey as one of the kindest individuals that she knows. He's always ready to offer a helping hand and a word of encouragement to those in need. His positivity and willingness to go with the flow have made him not only a wonderful colleague, but also a cherished friend to all who have had the privilege of knowing him. Julie, both a colleague, classroom neighbor, and former class parents speak fondly of Mr. Corey's impact as a teacher, sharing memories of her son's experience in his classroom and the lasting impressions that he has left on their family. To this day, her son has a recycled paper haiku and a drawing from an experiment hanging in his bedroom. Julie shares that Peter's willingness to share his passion for science and his generous spirit have made him a pillar of our community and he will be dearly missed by all those who have had the pleasure of crossing his path. Principal Marisa Ferrara stated, Peter's passion for teaching has inspired countless students and his impact will be felt for generations to come. His commitment to shaping young minds and nurturing a love for learning is truly admirable. Peter, you are the ultimate team player and go above and beyond for everyone and everything. You are truly someone to emulate. How amazing is it that after 47 years in education, you still have the energy and joy as if it were your first few years. What a testament to who you are. May this new chapter be filled with relaxation, joy, and new adventure for your wife, you, your children, and adorable grandchildren. Thank you for your unwavering dedication to the education and the children at Greenville. As we celebrate Mr. Corey's upcoming experiment in retirement, and as he embarks on his next great adventure, we extend our heartfelt thanks and best wishes for a retirement filled with joy, laughter, and endless blessings. Though he may be stepping away from the classroom, his legacy will live on in the hearts and minds of all who have been touched by his kindness, 
wisdom, and unwavering dedication to the pursuit of excellence in shaping the minds of eight past decades of students and the impact on many future generations. Congratulations, Peter, on a truly extraordinary career, a well-deserved retirement filled with endless opportunities for exploration, discovery, and of course, plenty of time for a little scientific mischief. <laughs> you will forever hold a special place in our hearts as Greenville's favorite scientist and cherished colleague. I will personally miss seeing you leave as one of the last people left in the school each night, especially when you greet me with, good night, kiddo. <laughs> I can only hope in my career I have left the same heart print on students' and colleagues' lives the way that you have. After countless experiments and discoveries in the classroom, we hope that you are ready to embark on your greatest experiment yet, mastering the art of relaxation and retirement. Congratulations from your Greenville family forever. Thank, thank you, Michelle, for recognizing one of our most distinguished mm -hmm. educators um, who will be retiring this year. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak this much tonight, and I know we have a long agenda, but in case Mr. Corey is watching, I just wanted to echo everything that was said and say for the past decade or so since my kids have been here every year, there's always a conversation among the parents. Is he, are we going to get, is our next kid going to be able to have him? And because he's that beloved and he's really that amazing at what he does and he is just the best human being. So I just wanted to say personally, congratulations to you. Um, he And the funniest thing that he told me is like, he's like, even though he's retiring, all he wants to do is keep learning. So he's trying to pick up the piano this summer. So um, good luck with that. And I can't wait to hear about your next adventure. Thanks, Mr. Corey. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to recognize the E-Club for stepping in and funding a fantastic news newsletter on behalf of Edgemont Sports. It hit my inbox today. Hopefully the rest of you got it. Um, in the absence of the Scarsdale Inquirer, Todd Sliss will be writing uh, this twice a season newsletter for the E-Club to cover our Panther teams. So please join the E-Club to support and receive this newsletter and learn more about Edgemont Athletics. Thank you to the E-Club for their creativity and commitment to the community and our school sports teams. You know, it's nice to, I, I miss reading the news in the Inquirer, so I look forward to reading that newsletter. And, and thank you to um, Todd for taking that project on. Um, I understand there's there's one person from the yes, community. Okay, okay. Uh, before, uh, Tom, you know the drill, but let me repeat it. Uh, recognition of the community includes the opportunity for community members to offer their thoughts to the board on any issues in the district, including those on the agenda. The board can't and won't respond to any questions asked in public comment. We have a specific agenda for this meeting. However, if warranted, the board will follow up on issues raised during public comment outside of the meeting or potentially add it to a future agenda if there are relevant updates for the community. Each community member can speak for up to three minutes and public comment will last for a total of 30 minutes. Well, I guess a total of three minutes if you're the only one speaking. Um, Jennifer will give you a verbal warning 30 seconds before the end of your time so you can wrap up your remarks. Thank you, this shouldn't take long. First of all, I'd just like to echo what we said about Peter Corey, who I had the pleasure of working with for about 20 years, and he was a gentleman and a scholar and a great colleague, and he will be missed by the Edgemont community. Um, I had written a very Thank compelling you. speech to the board for this evening. Um, I'm really a little disappointed I can't give it because I thought it was really good, but based on the latest rendition of the bond issue, um, which seems to have removed the Greenville Access Road, I just wanted to thank the Board of Education for listening to the community whose sentiments I thought were very clear and appreciate that the board listened and heard and made that revision to the bond issue. So I just want to say thank you all for all you have done. All right. So with that, we are on to acceptance of gifts. Dr. Hamilton. Yes. It is for this reason. There we go. All right. It is my pleasure to present nearly $20,000 in gifts this evening from the following donors and for the following purposes. From the PTA in the amount of $3,800 to Greenville for a nature classroom 
and a STEAM program at third grade, again at Greenville, from the PTA in the amount of $3,400, again to Greenville for a play group theater at, uh, for second grade students, from the Edgemont Elementary PTA in the amount of $950 to Greenville for a Japanese storytelling program, Edgemont PTA in the amount of $3,500 to Greenville an author visit with uh, Lauren Tashish for fourth grade students. Um, Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $2,500 to Edgemont Junior Senior High for the ACE National Jazz Festival. From the Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $2,500 to Edgemont Junior Senior High School to the class of 2028 STEM trip for Hudson Valley Renegades. Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $117.88 to Edgemont Junior Senior High School for the DECA fundraiser from Chipotle, from the Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $331.86 to the Edgemont Junior Senior High School, the class of 2026 from the Chipotle fundraiser, the Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $61.94 to the Edgemont Junior Senior High School for the class of 2025 Chipotle fundraiser, from the Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $91.62 to the Edgemont Junior Senior High School, for the class of 2027, the Edgemont PT, um, I'm sorry, for the Chipotle fundraiser, for the Edgemont PTSA, the amount of $350 to the Edgemont Junior Senior High School for Pride Works Conference, from the ele elementary, Edgemont Elementary PTA, in the amount of $1,280 to Sealy Place for a multicultural program for kindergarten and first grade students, and from the Edgemont PTSA in the amount of $835, $834 to Edgemont, uh, the Edgemont Greenville School for a high tech, high touch program for first grade students. Um, and additionally, for your consideration this evening, I am pleased to present to the board for acceptance, the donation from the Edgemont School Foundation in the amount of $33,333. All right. Do I have a motion to accept these gifts? First, Noreen. Second, Nilesh. Uh, any questions or comments? Oh. Just a quick comment on the School Foundation uh, for history and context for anyone who doesn't know. They pledged $500,000, a significant donation to the district uh, back in 2016 um, at roughly $33,333 a year, um, which will carry us all the way to the 2031 school year. So super appreciative um, on behalf of the district for that continued support. Um, it's something that, that um, uh, we've been happy to recognize each year and uh, their continued support continues to help us move forward. So thank you. All right, all in favor? Abstain. All, all right, unanimous with one abstention. Um, so we say this every time, but I hope everyone understands that we are truly and deeply appreciative to the PTA, the PTSA, uh, Edgemont School Foundation for these generous gifts, which it was a long list and it's a long list every week. They fund a whole bunch of really important uh, facilities, supplies and programmings that do impact our students. Uh, so thank you to all the community organizations run by volunteers and supported by community and which provide these important additional funding for us to offer enhanced programming to our students. Uh, moving on, we have no board committee reports. No committee reports this evening. And we have the board, I guess, vice president's report. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so we appreciate everyone who came out to our three forums to share their questions and concerns about the bond as proposed. We're excited to hear the support of the community for this bond and its critical infrastructure projects and have simultaneously reviewed options extensively to understand how we can achieve our goals while mitigating the concerns that have been discussed. As noted during the sessions, we can only make limited changes to the bond without needing to move the vote date given the legal requirements for environmental studies and notice. Tonight, we are introducing a modified bond proposal. To ensure that we address the emergency vehicle access issue, we are adding a reinforced subsurface along the back of Greenville School from the APR to the edge of the existing playground, and we'll regrade and widen the existing sidewalk coming from Ardsley Road to the APR. We will also resod the field as part of the site work. 
This will enable us to get emergency vehicles to the back of the school during the school day and during pickup and drop off when the front of the school is not accessible due to excessive traffic. This is just a first step. We continue to believe that a second egress at Greenville is critical to alleviate traffic and give emergency vehicles better access to the front of the school during pickup and drop off. Although this revised bond proposal will not include the two lane road in the back of Greenville, we urge future boards and the community to consider how to accomplish all of the goals we initially set out to achieve. But the goal of creating emergency access to the back of the building and improving accessibility during pickup and drop off will be accomplished with this revised plan. I will leave it to Brian to go over the additional details in his presentation. And so with that, we move on to the superintendent's report, yes. Dr. Hamilton. Thank you very much. Tonight for the superintendent's report, we are pleased to present <laughs> highlights of the reimagined bond. I would like to take this opportunity to express my deepest appreciation for the extraordinary work Brian Paul has done. In collaboration with the board, our school principals, this bond has been restructured. There are so many moving parts to developing a bond, particularly as we try to capture the various voices from our community. This required working with bond council, general council, district architects, state officials, environmental consultants, and our financial advisors. Additionally, and most importantly, working in concert with the superintendent to make certain that all elements of the bond were in alignment with an academic vision and a lens on the present and future of Edgemont schools. This has been a very heavy lift and Brian has been able to get it all done and keep us on schedule while also managing the proposed 2024-2025 general operating budget. So Brian, thank you. Tonight during the superintendent's report, you will hear from Brian on the revised capital bond. Following Brian's presentation, we will hear from our assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment, uh, Dr. Jeanette Bobbles, and our director of technology, Paul Garifano, on their proposed budgets for the next year. These budgets, by the way, have gone through an extensive defense process where the respective department leaders presented and defended their proposals to the superintendent and the cabinet to ensure alignment with district goals and best practices in education to advance student engagement and keeping a focus on moving Edgemont into the future. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brian and immediately following Brian will be Dr. Bobbles and then Paul Garifat. Thank you very much, and Jennifer, thank you for giving some context um, to the presentation that we make tonight. I look around the room, I see a lot of uh, faces that we've seen recently at a lot of the community forums. I thank you those of you who are here again tonight uh, to tune in. And for those who participated um, in the three community forums that we held at each of the three schools over the last two weeks. Um, for those of you who were not able to attend or, or were only at parts of them, and, and that's for administrators, faculty members, and anyone in the room, we had over 200 participants um, across the three nights. Um, and it was a great opportunity for us to really get a, uh, to hear voices um, as it relates to the feedback and how our bond proposal was received by the community. Um, I think as we, um, as Jennifer had pointed out, we, we heard the community uh, through this process. And I think it's really helped us narrow our focus down to ensure that we have a bond that we believe that the community can support and pass. Um, the glaring concern, the, the most obvious one that came up uh, resoundingly across the three um, individual forums, in particular at Greenville, was the concept of the inclusion of the two lane access road being something that the community could not get um, wrap their head around. And that at the same time, there was strong support for the other elements of the bond, many of them being safety and security related or programmatic um, or comfort based that the community wanted to be able to support, but felt that there was a sticking point in the design. I think important to note, um, the removal of the two lane access road in our revised plan does not meet all of the goals that we have established. But most notably, it does not help us resolve in a significant way, the traffic concerns that exist at the front of the building. Um, but through revised plans, we do believe that we're able to address the safety aspect and emergency vehicle access aspect of that proposal. To Jennifer's point and to the board's comments, uh, it's not that the board and administration does not feel as though this two lane access road is critical or important. It's that we have to juxtapose that 
with all of the other elements. And we're trying to package and ensure that we have a proposal that the community can support so that we can make the progress that's necessary in the district. Share with you um, some brief renderings and the differences in the plan. The original plan called for that two lane access road um, connecting the jug handle on Ardsley Road to, to work its way up on the east side of the campus and connecting to the um, rectangular asphalt parking lot where students play basketball now. In doing so, there were a few other modifications to the site plan that were um, in queue. One was to turn the uh, athletic field, the soccer field, a few degrees in order to accommodate for the uh, roadway and also to uh, remove the existing playground and turn the location that it's existing and build a new one. Um, in our revised plan, we've, by removing the two-lane access road, the original playground will stay as is. The soccer field will stay as is, but we'll get a facelift. Um, it is still in need of new sodding. Um, it does have irrigation, but we'll update any irrigation heads that are necessary. Um, it needs some new fencing, new backstop. That stuff is still contained in the new plan. In addition, there was always a plan uh, embedded in the original proposal for that existing walking path that runs up from the jug handle uh, to be reinforced and widened for vehicular access. Um, in doing so, in our revised plan, we're also adding a similar structure that's planned for Sealy Place up along the building itself. Essentially a fortified subsurface that will support the weight of an emergency vehicle like a ladder truck um, that will run the length of the building from that walkway to the existing playground. Um, you're, it's a um, fortified surface that allows for grass to be grown over it. So there wouldn't really be any visual change to the structure. Uh, John D'Angelo, uh, one of our partners here, our architect, um, did some additional work just to ensure that the grading was appropriate and could be met by a 42 foot ladder truck um, heading directly up that and making sure that the appropriate turning radiuses would be able to be achieved um, to permit a truck of that size to be able to access the back of the building. You'll notice that both plans call for a new parking lot uh, just to the west of the existing jug handle. Uh, that's critical and necessary for us in this case, in order to get the parking out of the jug handle now to ensure that emergency uh, vehicles um, are unobstructed in their path and to get up that lane. Um, you'll also note that in the, in the revised plan, we have still the, the front of the building um, proposals have remained the same. We spoke about the fact that this second egress, um, a major component of it was really to dissipate the traffic in the front uh, that exists on Glendale and then bleeds into the ABC streets. One of the uh, proposed solutions to that um, in absence of the two lane access road was to ensure that we kept the staging lane um, in the front of the building as part of the revised plan. Doing so, and that's the darker gray area that you see in the front of the building, will increase the length of the queuing lane uh, and be able to pull additional traffic off of Glendale um, and in result, uh, reduce the overall traffic that spills onto the ABC streets at pickup and drop off time. Uh, John's put together for us a couple of slides here that assisted show the changes that have been made to the plan uh, for those that have been following along the way. Um, contained in here represents all of the comments that I just spoke to. Uh, the idea that the field will remain the same, uh, that there'd be new sod, new fencing put in for the uh, backstop uh, and the removal of the road as you see it there. John, is there anything else uh, that you want to comment on in terms of the engineering aspect, um, the slope, the grading, turning radius, ability for the trucks to get in and out? Yeah, I think you stated it. We looked at made sure based on uh, the statements made by the, the chief at the previous two meetings that we ensure that we would be able to accommodate the larger apparatus that we that And thank you for bringing that up. I know um, Chief Spedaleri spoke at, at our Greenville uh, forum and I think has been a really strong advocate um, for us improving our uh, emergency access at all three campuses. Um, and I think this, what you'll see here is one of the plans that he spoke about that evening um, was that in a way to get immediate and simplest access to the building would actually be to run along um, uh, the back of the building as close as you could to it, as opposed to on the access path itself. And, and that, um, that conversation did absolutely inform the decision-making uh, that we've taken on here. 
Mm -hmm. I want to pause I think, before we jump into the second part because this is a little trunk um, segmented presentation. So any questions from the board and on the revised plan, uh, the visuals you see here, uh, you want to talk about before we get into what was the primary goal of tonight's presentation, which is cost estimations um, and financing impact. So Brian, can you also comment that we lose some parking spots on that semicircle and hence we need to accommodate some extra parking because we're losing some spots. Absolutely. And I think uh, so the two reasons why we will continue to propose the uh, that new parking lot there is that right now we currently get about 12? 19. 19, okay. Uh, park, faculty parking only in the jug handle. Um, that doesn't really help with those who want to use that as a drop-off location currently. Um, it actually gets very congested in there. Uh, so creating a faculty parking area um, just adjacent to that will help alleviate both those who are using the jug handle for drop-off um, and will then permit the unobstructed access for emergency vehicles. Anyone else? Right. Next. Great. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, so I'd like to introduce Kevin Sawyer, who's here from uh, Triton Construction, um, working with John D'Angelo from Fuller and D'Angelo. Kevin is um, going to be our, our principal contact uh, as our construction management team as we work our way through the uh, bond pre-referendum and construction process. Um, Kevin and his team have done the cost estimation analysis for us and work closely with John and his team to make sure that we have a good estimate here. They've also been collaborating on timelines um, for construction and the phasing. Uh, which is really important and intricately tied to the actual cost estimation process. Uh, so I'd like to invite Kevin up to the podium to talk a little bit about the uh, phasing and timeline and what that cost estimation process has looked like. Good evening, everybody. Um, First, I'd just like to say to the board and to the community, uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for allowing us uh, the opportunity to work again uh, with the board and the community uh, on in support of your of your endeavor here. Um, I'm the new guy here uh, on team. Uh, we've been involved here for the past couple of months. Uh, we've worked very, very closely with your administration um, and your architect. Uh, in developing the bond scope and the understanding of what that entails to create your overall budget. Um, so first I wanna talk a little bit about the construction phasing timeline, which we have uh, here on the screen. Uh, this is was developed uh, in consultation with the architect and um, school. It, uh, it utilizes some real time um, construction costs and data, um, and it's a process, right? So for those of you who are not familiar with the process, you do a pre-bond, a pre-referendum process. There's a bond vote by the community. <clears throat> After the vote, we go into what's called pre-construction. That pre-construction time could take a year to 18 months, depending on the program that you're trying to get done and how many phases of the project there are. Um, here we have, this is only shows you package one and two is a second slide that shows package three and four. So the initial thought is a four phase or four packaged schedule. Um, we go through the pre-construction process, then, that's, 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 then the drawings are approved by the, by the board. And um, uh, then we send it out to the state education department for their approval, they're the ones that review it for code compliance and many other things. Uh, you receive the permits from the state education department. Uh, once, and that process takes a little bit of time. Um, right now, that process is about 24 to 26 weeks. So we have to make sure we include those types of timelines in the overall program. After you receive the uh, uh, approvals from the state, then we go into the bid process. So that'll take about a, uh, a month to six weeks. Assuming everything goes well there, uh, we will make a recommendation to the board for approvals of those contracts. Uh, and if the board does so approve those contracts, we will then move forward into construction. So uh, 
the information that we have here in development, and by the way, this is a work in progress, right? Um, we, this is a, these are goals that we're setting in, from 60,000 feet. Uh, as we move forward in the process, we will refine this in more, much more detail right? to give you guys a better sense of where we're gonna be very specifically and how long it's going to take and those types of details. For now, it's, 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 it's simplistic boxes. Right, and hopefully for those that are out there, it does give you some sense of timelines, some of the work within your individual buildings um, that we're trying to achieve. The first projects that we're looking at in package one were actually projects that have been developed somewhat uh, with the, the architect over time. A lot of that information is already existing. Some of the some of the costs were already existing, and that helped a great deal in. Uh, us evaluating the overall budget for this next upcoming project. So phase one had things like the new cafeteria at, uh, at uh, the high school with the kitchen renovations, uh, also at Greenville Cafe. Um, package two moves a little bit down um, the schedule. Um, so you go from 25 for the uh, site work uh, at Sealy and Greenville. Um, then we go into the uh, high school building, A Reno, uh, Sealy Steam. Uh, and then after that, uh, summer of 26, then we start looking at the uh, high school building, A renovations, which most likely will be a couple of summers or perhaps some after school work. Um, and by the way, you, you, we take all of these things into consideration when we're putting together the costs, right? Because there's escalation involved in time. We have to make sure that we, we, we understand what particular projects are going to happen when so we make sure we can account for all the costs uh, over time. And also, we have to take into consideration use. Um, this is a, you, you have to make sure when school opens in September that the kids can come and utilize all these spaces as planned. Uh, so we will develop these programs around the educational process to minimize the best we can the uh, disturbances or exposures um, that the students will have uh, during the regular school year. Uh, so that is phase two. And then the next slide indicates package three, uh, which goes to your fields. And uh, the fields we're projecting will be uh, a little bit before, a little bit after the summer of 2026. Uh, along with some HVAC security door upgrades and things of that nature that will take place too. Again, those will be things that we'll try and do as much as we can over summer times, but could also be done after the school, after school hours too, after our session. Uh, and then package four, the final package will be the, the rest of the programs to catch uh, that's part of this bond, including um, uh, high school resource building renovations, art uh, building renovations, and the administration spaces. So there is some some bullet points on the bottom, just in case uh, um, you want to get some idea, perhaps for your individual buildings, where we think some of these projects will start and end. Um, and again, as we move forward, Pat, assuming that uh, a positive uh, bond vote, we will obviously come back many times after that and develop this in much, much more detail. Yeah, before we talk about costs, just a, a couple highlights um, from my perspective, the package one that um, that he spoke of, those are things that we have approvals for right now. Uh, so those have been the things we've submitted to the state. We don't need to redesign. We don't need to repackage. Uh, the vast majority of the work, even if it's been included uh, or was included in the 21 bond, needs some redesign uh, because of the interconnectedness of, of the projects. Um, so it's really beneficial to us to be able to get that package out as soon as possible, um, to take on the debt from that and to complete that project so that we can start to get state aid coming back to us um, to kind of help fill that gap and that void that's going to grow as we bring on new debt. Um, and so really thankful and happy that we have a project that we're going to be able to move forward quickly with, with a successful bond. Um, but you will note, and I, and I just want to be clear on this, the three cafeteria projects are, are very intertwined. Um, in order to be able to do the food service at the elementary schools, that will be the final outcome. It requires the high school kitchen and cafeteria to complete its renovation so that we have the space to produce that food. 
Um, it would then require a new contract with a new, well, not necessarily a new, but a new contract with a vendor um, for food service, uh, really changing the scope of what they do now, what they just produce food for seven through 12. Um, so given the fact that the Sealy Place project um, is not part of package one, we wouldn't be able to bring the food service aspect of that to the elementary schools until the 26, 27 school year at the earliest. Based on this very tentative sketch right now, we're talking about probably early fall um, in that school year, probably not September 1st, but, but maybe an October, November um, date in there would be best case scenario. I just have one question. So the only part that kind of uh, I would like to know more is uh, there is a building A renovation which is going to run during the school year of 26, 27. And I'm just wondering uh, what kind of uh, problems can be envisaged, what can be done to mitigate that and any thoughts that you have. I'll take the first stab on that. So we, we did talk about that one length. It's actually the one that um, I think we agree is most concerning. Um, we don't have the swing space at the junior senior high school to take a whole section out of play and 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 just work. Um, it really is a three summer project. Um, and we, I know John and I have talked about this separate from and, and also with Kevin. Um, we're going to have to look at that carefully as to how we can best to do that. Um, it is more likely than not that we will not be taking classrooms out of play during the school year, mm -hmm. um, but instead really trying to contain sections of the work into summer projects. Um, there is some work that can be done as third shift or night work. Uh, new cabling, um, that can, cables, wires that can be pulled um, during times that would not be disrupting the, the school academic program. Uh, but we're going to be very sensitive to that. And we're talking about a complete um, mechanical system changeover as well from the existing heating and ventilation to a new air conditioned system. Um, that's going to be pretty complicated to try to do while uh, class starts session. And the other comment was, uh, as we implement the ACs across all the few buildings. Uh, it also has a two-step process of upgrading the whole electrical wiring. And I see that running for 26, 27 school year again. And if that could be broken up to a more kind of a least disruptive timeline for the school. So just, an, just a comment that I'm sure you are. A oh, thank you. No, I appreciate all the comments um, as I'm still learning about mm -hmm. how the school operates. Mm -hmm. um, these comments are very helpful. So yes, thank you. John, I wonder if you could just speak to um, like load analysis, like where do we need to bring on additional electrical load um, and how that would fit into the timelines? Uh, do we yet know uh, which buildings that we would certainly need to do that? Um, or is that still kind of an unknown for us? Right now it's, it's an unknown in developing the entire scope and then developing an implementation schedule. Um, some buildings and some classrooms are going to be relatively easy to add air conditioning to, and they might move up higher in the schedule, or if we can fit certain projects within the summer um, and have smaller projects and smaller chunks that we can take out of it, we'll definitely take advantage of that and bring that construction, get it implemented and get it, get it online as early as possible. So there, there will be some that will develop, will need electric upgrades, and that will complicate the entire installation and drag out the timelines with the long lead times and some of the electrical equipment and some of the electrical switchgear equipment. That so, as we start to develop the projects, we'll definitely be looking at um, the. The, the time impact of each of those projects and how they can fit into the overall project. The same with the scope of the, the cameras and security upgrades and trying to get as much as that done as we can early in the projects and get those systems up online as obviously as early as we could for uh, those needed components. Uh, but then also, you know, looking at the, the overall project and integrating that into the overall thing. So it, it will be a fluid. This project right now is looking at chunks of time and timelines and looking at it as a overall view for the next three, four years. But in reality, there's going to be a lot of little pieces that will be developed throughout those big block and chunks of time. Got it. I would just I think one of the unique parts of the, uh, not the major air conditioning projects, but more the individual classroom projects is that uh, the because the scope can be shortened to smaller groups, 
I think as John pointed out, we might be able to tackle some of that before the milestone dates that you see here. I always use the C building as an example. It was my old home as a teacher. There's four classrooms and two offices. That project in itself might, as we define it, be much smaller and simpler. It might be able to come on board before those milestone dates that we've identified. My other question is the uh, state aid, will it start coming to us after the whole work is done or will it start coming on a project-wise basis based on the state aid for each of the projects? So I think I'll give a short answer now and I'll, I'll try to fill in some more later in this. Um, you need to submit a final cost report. So we're, we're gonna complete the project and be able to make a submittal to the state that the project has been completed before aid will start to roll onto the books. Packaging this into four groups like we are now is will allow us to go out, um, probably do multiple bond offerings to obtain funding. Once we can complete a project, um, we can then issue the final cost report. Aid would start to be available to us the subsequent year. Yeah. Thank you. For each individual project submitted to the state. Correct. And, and each building would have its individual project, project number. So there's four packages listed here, but in reality, there might be 15 or 20 actual project submissions to the state. And as each one of those are completed, final cost reports and, and final project completion reports are submitted to the state, then the aid for that particular project is yeah, and again, you know, I really want to kind of compliment for all the work because the I really want to send this message to the community that we are being very prudent in terms of how we are planning and how we're getting the state aid and when we're issuing the debt. So there's a lot of numbers out there. So when you look at these pictures, you also look at how the whole planning has been done on a stage-wise basis. So there is a least amount of impact for the community on a fiscal basis. So that's a limited point I wanted to also highlight for everybody's benefit. So thank you. So before we move on to the next part of this presentation, uh, does anyone else on the board have any questions or comments about the construction phasing? One just quick question. Um, so it shows here that for package two, you have the Sealy and Greenville site work happening throughout the school year 25-26 school year. How is that going to interfere with using the fields near these areas for, for, for student usage, that is? At Sealy and Greenville, we don't anticipate uh, any disruption of the field. A lot of the Sealy site work is the, the remote parking area, which would, could occur separate from any student uh, occupied areas. Um, and any other uh, areas are small enough that we can get done over the summer. So we don't anticipate any disruption to the recreational facilities at Sealy or Greenville. Okay. And we spoke about that in our most recent meeting. Certain aspects of it can be done, really need to be targeted to summer. Other aspects can occur at different <laughs> times. Uh, so I think we chose just to keep the rectangle as a wide span on there. Another example would be the Greenville parking lot. Um, the Greenville parking lot could be worked on during um, the school year. It, it's uh, certainly adjacent to the building, um, but far enough removed where we could set up staging and be able to do some work there. Um, th this is still a preliminary draft. And I think once we get down into, if we haven't approved on, um, we really get into the weeds on how um, the timelines will work out on that. But I think, you know, in, in all aspects of this, we're trying to preserve um, the fields for the right time. So for example, the baseball softball field would come offline at the end of the spring season. And as soon as that spring season ended is when we would begin construction with the mindset we would want to hope, open up for the next spring as well. Thank you. Why are Heather, Jim? All right, I think we're ready to move on. If you want to talk just a little bit about the cost estimation process and, and what your team's done to get us to where we are today. Sure. So, um, so what we did, um, it was we we've had oh gosh, uh, three or four, maybe five meetings to discuss the overall uh, project scope versus uh, anticipated costs. Um, some of the different uh, things that we utilize in developing uh, our costs our actual costs uh, for other school districts from bid openings that we've had recently uh, for some types of projects, like for instance, your fields at the high school. Uh, we have we are working uh, on similar projects just this past summer. So we have some real time costs of what some of those are. Um, 
Uh, we, we have some old big, big numbers and costs for other projects. We've gotten some information from vendors for things like PA and security. And uh, so we've inputted a lot of that information in. Uh, we also have uh, a database in our off office because uh, uh, right now Triton is working in 21 school districts from Catskills, the farthest one north, all the way out to Smithtown on Long Island. Um, so as bids come into our office, we, we take all that information in and we take a look at our overall costs, make sure that we have a good sense of what the square footage cost is for STEM lab renovations or cafeteria, kitchen improvements because of uh, we're doing a lot of those uh, throughout the, the Hudson Valley and Long Island. So we take all that information, we put it together, uh, uh, we take a one shot um, estimate, we look at it as if we're a contractor, right? What would the contractor's cost be? Logistics, coordination, um, uh, general conditions, right? Uh, nicer is just to put more insurance requirements on school districts. So we make sure that we have real-time information about what those costs are. We have about 1.7% costs just for that alone. So we taking all that information, we compile into a, a cost proposal. And then what we do is a, what's called a reconciliation. So we sit down with the architect and we say, okay, do we understand the program correctly. We sit down with Ray and, and Brian. Do we understand the logistics of this? How we can get this done? And then with that information, uh, we start to compile numbers. We do a little add and subtract, and then this is what it spit out. Okay, so um, you've probably seen the line items that are the bullets that are on here before. So you've talked about what they are, and if there's any questions about it, please um, feel free to ask. Um, I just want to just focus on um, the subtotals for each building and then the total, if that's okay. Perfect. And then if you guys have any questions, ask away. So Greenville Elementary School, we're anticipating the overall cost to complete that scope of work to be 10,850, 10 million. <laughs> 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 right. right um, sorry about that. Uh, $10,850,000. Um, that is all inclusive of all what we believe all the soft costs will be. So that's uh, fees and consultants and insurances and, and all of those things. It includes a, a bit of a, con a construction contingency for anticipations for mm -hmm. potential changes that might occur during the cost of construction per se, unforeseen site conditions or something like that. Um, and it includes um, some escalation. So we anticipate a percentage of the project over each year, and then we add uh, costs for escalation uh, for each year to anticipate material and labor cost increases. Um, again, if you have any questions on any of those things, discuss that later. Uh, Sealy Place is the next number. Uh, $7,475,000 is what we anticipate the cost will be in order to achieve that scope of work and the timeline that we have shown you tonight. All right. Uh, same rules apply with how we came up with the number. Uh, that is a, what we call an all-in number. That means it includes all of those hard costs, soft costs, and contingencies. The next one is the junior senior high school. Um, and that is obviously considerably more than all the rest, but it also has a number of items that are that have uh, larger volumes of overall work. Forty-five million six hundred fifteen thousand um, dollars, including some very extensive work both inside the building, right? Alterations, additions, and then um, synthetic turf fields and various other site work, roadways, and things um, around the building. So um, the final cost estimates, um, those three numbers plus, so we had in the original numbers that were set up, um, some escalating costs through 2025 built in. Uh, 
So the, the, there is an escalated cost for percentages of work for um, 2026 and 2027. Those are those later packages that we talked about. And we anticipate those to be approximately 5% for the first year and then another 5% over the second year, totaling 10. Uh, so that's the additional 1.5 and 1.2, giving you a total cost for the bond potentially, uh, of $66,817,300. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great, go ahead. Couple questions. Two questions. Um, first, I know that uh, when our the original bond was approved, there were some soft costs that we already uh, started um, to use in the bond compensation out. So are these met of that? Uh, yes and no. Um, so the soft costs that are embedded in there, we have roughly 20% embedded in, and that does speak to architect's fees, uh, construction management fees, testing, um, and other aspects of that. Um, we did not net out every part of that because we want to ensure that in that, those other ancillary costs, soft costs, contingencies, and escalation, that we don't find ourselves in the same position that we are in um, in the 21 bond. So yes, we, we have a sense as to how much money is in there um, that... Um, if you could do a straight um, subtraction from that we could um, identify, but we believe it's necessary to keep in there to ensure that we remain under budget, on budget with escalation costs. Right, so that's like sort of my second question is because escalation was like the primary factor for derailing the first bond, um, I assume all the costs are just generally higher. Are, did you treat the rate of escalation that's embedded um, differently um, as a result. Like, is, it high, are, is the rate of escalation also higher in addition to kind of like your base? Yeah, I don't. I don't remember what. Um, I'd have to look back at what escalation factor was put in on the original uh, 2021 proposal. Um, we may have carried a similar amount at the time. Um, the reality was it wasn't for a lack of of escalation costs or contingencies. It was really just that uh, we could not predict the market rate change that occurred. Um, I did push uh, both the individuals here just to make sure that they feel confident that those numbers that we've settled on, like a 5% construction contingency, is sufficient for upcoming change orders. Other things. Um, I know Kevin was able to speak specifically to work with John and other projects and, and whether any of past projects that they've done together have ever gone past that 5% threshold. They couldn't speak to any. Um, so I, I certainly did want it before we came up with what those um, extra costs are um, to make sure that we were all comfortable with that number. And I, I think I got a resounding yes from the group, which makes me feel comfortable with them. And, and, and your questions were asked in our analysis. So we, we were we were on that. Thank you. Um, hold on. Okay. Heather, did you have anything before I moved down this side? Thanks. I had a, just a question again, as it relates to the phasing, I'm imagining some of it is reflective of just practical expectations in terms of the amount of time it's gonna take to obtain the state approvals necessary. Is there any scenario where that process has all of a sudden become very efficient and this whole timeline moves up earlier or is this just practically speaking going to last until the end of essentially 2027? So I've been doing this for 30 years and I started out as an optimist. <laughs> now I'm kind of a realist. Um, and so to answer your question, is there a possibility? Sure. The state education department may decide to go back with a third, uh, third party review cycle that decreases the review time at the state from seven months down to four months. That's a significant amount of time. And with time is money. Right. So if we can, if they, if the state, uh, you know, expedites that process, that could surely help all of us, um, both in time and, and, and in money. So, yes, um, when we put together the final parts of the overall schedules, depending on, you know, the availability to get into certain spaces, we would very much like to try and move programs up. Again, that the more we can get done sooner, the, the better it is for everyone. It's spaces and things that you can use right away, um, but also there's a value to that 
that we very much would like to try and, and, and take advantage of. So we're always thinking about that um, through our process. I think that also speaks to John's point of, although we're seeing it as four um, packages here, each package will have many separate um, smaller projects. As if we can get approvals on different packages, the timing at which we go out to bid on them will be dependent on what we have. Um, in any way that we can escalate it while not disrupting the educational program, we would. Um, you know, as, as we're predicting here, if it's 5% a year, that's extra money um, each time that we're unable to, to meet that. Yeah, so uh, okay. Brian, can you just clarify for the community benefit, why is Greenville cafeteria so expensive compared to the CD cafeteria? I'm, I'm going to pass that one. <laughs> Well, I mean, Sealy is not a new addition. So you've got a substantial new cafeteria space addition that you're putting in there. Uh, the second part is is the actual kitchen. Uh, the kitchen is, it's a large kitchen. Uh, so the, the stainless steel equipment that's in it is. The, he's saying Greenville. Greenville. To Sealy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The two elementary schools, sorry. Two elementary schools? Uh, well. You can take it if you want to. Please. So, so Greenville and Sealy. So, so, but I don't think we're doing a lot in Sealy, uh, right? It's not a lot of work that's in Sealy. The major difference, um, Sealy, we're essentially keeping the same footprint of the cafeteria, same, uh, not not a lot of ancillary construction. The major cost also is the HVAC system which is a totally new system at Greenville. We're replacing the 2000 wing Sealy system, converting that to air conditioning with the rooftop units. So that cost is incorporated in, in another portion of the, the Sealy renovation project. Um, and at Greenville, we had the removal of the raised platform, modifications to that exterior door, creation of an exterior ramp, to get up to that that level, so we can bring in uh, the the food carts from the high school. So a lot of ancillary construction at Greenville that that Sealy just doesn't have. Okay. And just one more question is, uh, what percentage of uh, air conditioning coverage we'll have after this whole thing is done? Maybe fifty percent, seventy percent, hundred percent? Just a rough estimate. So at, as priced out in this, that is a hundred percent of classroom spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, it does not include air conditioning for the gymnasiums. Mm -hmm. um, and does it include the Greenville Library? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think we're ready to move on. I Thank see there's you. a couple more. Thank you both. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. So then the, kind of putting this all together, um, talk about the overall tax impact, the budget. How do we expect this, um, the acquisition of, of the funding sources to look? Um, the phasing is really important to us, and the phasing is going to dictate um, how much cash we need at any given time. Uh, we don't yet have a cash flow document. That's something that we would produce um, if we had a successful uh, bond proposal. And um, we would then be working off of that to establish a timeline with bond council to do so. The um, In order to come up with an estimate for what the tax impact is, we need to come up with some uh, criteria that we're gonna use to make estimations. Um, so we are um, kind of trying to be uh, consistent across the board of just using today's data. I'm not trying to make projections of what interest rates will look like in the future, not trying to make projections of what uh, state aid ratios will look like in the future, but just using today's values. Um, so the basis for our estimation that, that I'm going to provide for you in a moment is based on the current market rate for similarly positioned school districts. Um, we work with our uh, financial advisors at Capital Markets, um, and they've indicated to us that as of uh, this month, similarly positioned districts are getting interest rates just below 3% um, at about 2.97. So we are certainly not in the market that we were in um, in 22 and 23, when we were seeing uh, mid to high fours, um, and we were talking a lot about opportunities to refinance at that time. Um, there are also uh, projections that the feds will at least hold rates um, over the next many months, if not reduce. Um, and so I can share that our advisor does think that this is a conservatively high estimate for by the time we were to go out for our first bond offering, um, he anticipates it being lower. Um, but for the purpose of this activity, we've used a 2.97% interest rate. 
Um, the other base of estimation here or knowledge that we would need for that is we plan to secure them in at least three separate offerings at this point in time. Um, best way to think of it is to secure enough funds uh, for the 25-26 construction, the 26-27, and the 27-28 um, in three separate offerings. Uh, it's roughly uh, 10 million, 30 million, and then the balance of about, um, sorry, 20 million, 30 million, and the balance of about 12 million in the third. That matters is we wouldn't want to take on additional debt um, when we don't have the expenditures at the time. And we want to try to align the state aid that we get um, for this project as closely as we can to the start um, of the issuance of that additional funding. The last part is our current uh, building aid ratio. We are currently getting 49.5% in building aid, which is, is really uh, beneficial to the district. In 2021, we were using an estimate of 30% at the time. Um, we were at, I think, 39%, 39.5%. We do know we have a floor that the state will not go below. Um, that is roughly 30% for us. Um, but based on the current the way that that formula generates, we're getting about 50% of the approved building projects back in state aid. Um, just to expand on the question that Nilesh asked earlier, um, the way that the we've done this scenario out is for each project, um, there is a period of time where we are bringing on additional debt, but we don't yet have aid to support it. Those first few years can be a little bit tricky, um, but we have been positioning ourselves for this for many. Um, and so I think it's important for the community to know that we have very intentionally um, tried to limit the use of reserves over the last few years. We've had um, a, a handful of really fortunate years with surpluses at the end um, and have been able to put away that money in places that will be able to help us offset uh, those a little bit more delicate first few years until we see aid fully flowing on the projects. Best way that we can say this, and there's a number of different ways to talk about the tax impact, is we're trying to be authentic to how we positioned this bond in 2021, um, as this is really a continuation of that. Uh, it was the board's desire and very strategically to try to capture rolling off debt um, that was coming off of our books at the end of the 22-23 school year. And with the previous approved bond, we were ready to do that, but unable to move forward. Since that time, we've made strategic decisions to invest additional money in capital projects um, through transfers to the capital fund. Um, in doing so, we've allocated approximately two and a half million um, last year and soon to come in budget presentations, uh, we hope to propose approximately two million um, in this year's budget towards projects that would otherwise have been included in the bond and would have only increased the overall scope and cost um, for us. By positioning ourselves um, in that strategic way, we've been able to hold on to um, debt service and capital outlay costs over this time period in 22, 23 and 23, 24. So we're gonna uh, present to you today the tax impact as it relates to that baseline of what are our, what is our current expenditure in existing debt service plus the capital outlay that we have put out um, each of the last two years so that there's a baseline of from the 24-25 budget, what would the impact be after that? Um, right now, the average assessed home in Edgemont for the assessor is about 1.25 million. Uh, we're gonna relate it to just $1 million assessed value so that you can extrapolate from there. So for every million dollars in assessed value, we estimate an average net increase of $602 in school taxes per year, beginning in the 25-26 school year. Um, we would not be issuing our first debt, um, our, our first bond to take on new debt until that year. And we would not start to see aid on that part of the project until at least the 26-27 school year. Put a note in there that the first and the last three years are more variable due to the debt um, issuance dates and the timeline for the state aid receivables. Basically, you have uh, a few years that get heavier and then it kind of very much normalizes and comes down to that average rate. And then on the back end, the last few years, 15, 16, 17, and 18, um, in these scenarios, you actually are receiving aid on projects that were completed um, that there's not a perfect one-to-one -one al uh, alignment. On. So you may not have debt service, but you're getting aid um, on the back end. That's something that we experienced this year um, as we're still receiving 
sorry, last year, we were still receiving um, aid on projects that we no longer had debt service on. Um, I've included for the board in, in your individual packets, the information that came from capital markets regarding the proposed um, scenarios. Um, you'll note that the three scenarios they've outlined, they are three different issuances of a 30 million, a $20 million, um, a $30 million and a $12 million issuance uh, to get us to our maximum amount. Um, if you look at it on the whole, a $66 million um, set of projects like this at about 3% equates to approximately $80 million in total principal and interest payments over that 15 year period. Um, if you net out then the state aid you receive on it, it's gonna be approximately 30 million if our aid ratio would stay the same. So the all-in cost over 15 years is approximately $50 million um, with the interest included in that. Um, one thing I didn't expand on that I, I just do want to touch on here is that in our previous iteration in 2021, we were estimating a 20-year term for most of these bonds. That was a blended rate, a uh, blended term based on the types of projects we were completing. At that time, we had significant new uh, construction which was going to be aided on a much longer period from the state. The state provides aid on renovations for 15 years. Um, and since the vast majority to almost all of our work is renovations, uh, we are most likely to um, use that as the uh, debt issuance so that it's aligned with the aid that we receive as well. And then just the last part before I talk about future opportunities for us to engage, um, we are, with the removal of the Sealy, uh, the Greenville access road, we are looking to package this as just one proposition um, on the May 21st vote. Um, as you know, there will be actually a few things that happen on that day. That is the date of the budget vote. That would be Proposition 1, would be the authorization um, of the tax levy uh, to support the budget. Proposition 2 would be the bond vote, uh, fully encompassing the entire scope that we have discussed tonight and in previous iterations. And then, of course, the uh, board um, uh, trustee votes um, that will occur as well on the same night. Lastly, we have um, a community forum coming up next Thursday. Uh, the ones that we've accomplished, that we've um, participated in over the last few weeks were all school-based. And we really asked the questions to be very specific to individual schools with the principal there to be able to support and talk about the instructional program. Um, the remaining community forum on March 7th, uh, which will be here at the junior senior high school, uh, we are trying to ensure uh, location, it, auditorium. So we'll, it'll actually be in the auditorium, um, although it says LGI here, and I know that the publications that will go out will be um, will represent that as well. That's an opportunity to come um, and talk really about any aspect of the project um, at any of the schools. Now that we've talked about cost and tax impact, uh, to discuss finances uh, in a similar forum and an opportunity to have uh, bi-directional dialogue. That's a little bit different than the board meetings themselves. And then we have dedicated uh, three additional um, items on agen future agendas for board meetings to talk specifically about bond, uh, but there will be additional opportunities that are not listed here. Think of more small group, um, targeted audience, PTA, PTSA, um, community organizations, uh, which we will be reaching out to as well um, to see if they're interested in engaging in a smaller, uh, more intimate forum than what the um, community forums or the board meetings currently avail. That'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. All right. Well, thank you. That was a lot. <laughs> and and thank you, John and, and Kevin, for, for all the information you provided. Um, I guess before we move on to uh, the next part, just check and see if there are any board questions on this last segment. So I have no question, just one comment. Uh, I would request the company to also come for the budget presentation because you have to tie in all the hard work which the brand has been doing for the last two, three years on smoothing out the whole burden for the community on the, especially on the capital side to understand why, how he's talking about the numbers that he spoke in the last slide. So that's my only request. Um, and that's on Thursday, you're making the presentation? Yes, so uh, we have a number of, of makeup meetings along the way here. So Thursday, we will um, be talking about the tax levy for next year, our proposed tax levy. We'll also be looking at the revenue side of the budget to see um, what we anticipate bringing in. And then subsequently next Tuesday, uh, we'll be looking more on the expenditure side 
uh, packaging together all of the individual presentations. Some you'll see tonight, others you'll see on Thursday um, to talk about what our expenditures are and trying to make those two match. Lots of budget talk. <laughs> Do I, uh, Heather, you have anything? All right, I guess we are. And I'll just make one last comment. I appreciate the thanks that was provided by the board, but I, I want to share that with everybody. Um, Ray, Amy, our architects, our um, uh, Triton and Kevin and the board who have done a ton of work uh, in the background here to get these forums off the ground. I know that the community um, was very appreciative of the opportunity to have that voice. Um, much of that work was taken on by various members of the board. So I thank you uh, for that. And for our internal team, we certainly could not be where we are today um, with all your support. So thank you. Absolutely. I should have said that myself. So uh, Now we're ready. <laughs> thank you so much. Good evening. Just so you all know, I have nothing to say about the bond at this time, in case you were curious. <laughs> totally different set of subjects coming to you. Tonight, it is my pleasure to present the 24-25 budget proposal for the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. For those of us, I have not had the opportunity in terms of looking at the audience here tonight to get to know in any way, shape, or form. I am your Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Dr. Jeanette Baldus. Just as was the case for last year's presentation, I thought it important to begin with two slides that encompass references that you'll hear me make and you'll also see with respect to the acronyms that are listed here. I do wanna draw everyone's attention to the representation of Dibbles. This was our first return to Dibbles in terms of thinking about the beginning, middle and end of year assessments that we're anticipating will take place this year on looking at literacy directly connected to our Science of Reading District Initiative. So again, you'll hear me speak to this. We see a couple of nods in the audience having to do with what ultimately has been a very successful endeavor as far as, again, supporting the Science of Reading, which you'll hear me speak to momentarily. The other thing I wanted to just draw your attention to is what you'll see in the representation of SCD, that's the Superintendent's Conference Days, we have four typically built into our annual school calendar, meaning for the entire district. You'll hear me speak to this when I reference professional development in some of the ensuing slides this evening. In addition to which, something new in the way of what's listed at the very bottom of this glossary page is TCI, which speaks to Teachers Curriculum Institute. This is in fact directly connected to what you'll hear me speak about shortly, having to do with the grades K to six committee recommendation for social studies piloting of instructional materials and resources next year. With that being said, I thought it important just to highlight our district goals and to also just speak to some extent to much of which is often unseen in the field of curriculum instruction and assessment. When we think about all of our work directly connected to curriculum writing in particular, as well as all of our work directly connected to curriculum writing or curriculum mapping itself, we don't necessarily see the direct results and how that impacts the district when it comes to district goals. So I thought it important tonight just to highlight that those two particular parts of what's embedded in this proposal, again, curriculum writing or curriculum mapping, coupled with professional development, make what you see on this screen possible with respect to components one, two, and three. Again, sometimes this is the unseen work that we put forth as a team of teachers, administrators, and support staff members in our community, meaning the school community. Nonetheless, I wanted to just draw everyone's attention to this. 
In moving ahead to the process, what was particularly valuable for me this year was the gift of time. At this time last year, I had only been employed in the district for I think six weeks or maybe even a little bit less than that. And I stood before you here at a public board of education meeting and had gone through this process that you see listed here. The great news about that experience is that it not only worked well last year, but it also worked well this year as far as pulling everything together. What I can say though, again, is having had the gift of time, it made this process a very fruitful endeavor as far as being able to drill down and be even more thorough as far as thinking about in particular what you see listed here in the way of the third item, the audit of where we presently are, in particular having to do with the alignment between Greenville and Sealy Place Schools, which is moving along quite well, and also extending to what you see listed there in the way of enrollment, inventories, and purchase histories. Very, very important. I would be remiss if I did not draw our attention to the second item listed. There's been an ongoing digging of data here to get a sense of where our children are performing well and what we can celebrate, and then what we can extend to accelerate that even further. That's something that very much went into the planning of what you're hearing me communicate tonight and also what you will largely hear the building level administrators and other departments present on when they're standing before you to share their budget proposals as well. In moving ahead, this is the bottom line. At first blush, sticker shock. I understand when we look at the overall percentage here of 66.4%. So I wanna bring a little bit of clarity to why this is so high. If you take a look at the differential, which is to say this year for the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, the budget is $275,573, moving to $458,537 for next year in the proposed. That differential of $182,964 is largely the direct connection between what you see listed there in two parts. Moving ahead with a customized report card for grades K through five at both Greenville and Sealy Place schools, in addition to which a pilot from our committee work for grades K to six social studies materials and resources. If you add that together, those two, that accounts for 74% of the delta or the change attributing to that 66.4%. We had a late arrival into my budget presentation, which you'll hear me speak to, having to do with professional development. We elected to make a commitment next year at Greenville and Sealy Place Schools to invest in a very large expenditure having to do with supporting mathematics professional development. That's also largely attributing to that delta there of the 182,000 $964. And so as I transition to what I started to highlight before, which would be our social studies pilot for next year, I just want to share with everyone in attendance tonight what the process was. It was quite an invaluable one. For the beginning part of this academic year, we had a committee of grades K to six teachers as well as administrators from Greenville and Sealy Place Schools come together through a series of committee experiences to review and ultimately evaluate print and digital resources that we could potentially purchase, adopt, implement, and eventually evaluate again throughout the course of next year to provide social studies instruction in a far more efficient and appropriate manner at both of our elementary schools next year. In the committee work itself, we did our due diligence as far as being extremely thorough. We reached out not only to the vendors to participate in presentations that they offered were the three programs that you see listed here, Savis, formerly known as Pearson, Studies Weekly, and as well, Teachers Curriculum Institute, TCI. We also took a look at McGraw-Hill, 
followed by Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES and the program that they have developed combined with English language arts. So in looking at all five of these, again, for both digital and print, the committee's recommendation after hearing from the vendors was to seek some feedback from our neighboring school districts, districts such as Chappaqua, who had been utilizing one or more of these particular programs and also had insight into having recently conducted a committee process, much as we had undergone at the time that we were asking them these questions. And so, born from all of this, a couple of things. We wanna move in the direction of what you see listed here on this particular slide, just for one year. We're not at a point as a committee where we feel strongly enough that we wanna to say to the Board of Education, we'd like to make a three, four or five year commitment to these particular programs. We wanna have a trial run next year, reconvene the committee as needed and decide if we wanna make a longer term investment as far as truly examining the efficacy of these programs once they're implemented. With that being said, just to bring some perspective to some of what's here and some of what's not here. Very thoughtful question came my way last evening, having to do with what you see listed here for TCI. You'll notice there's a gap in grade levels. We're looking for SABAs for grades two through four rather than TCI. And the reason for that is because TCI, by its own admission as a vendor, does not offer materials and resources that are aligned to the New York State Education Department's learning standards. So there's nothing for us to purchase there that would be consistent enough with meeting those measures as far as how we teach social studies. That is why you see SAV is for grades two through four. The other thing that I wanna capture in looking at this particular slide here for this pilot for next year is that consider the following. We have social studies materials and resources presently at Greenville and Sealy Place schools that are a decade or more old. So that's something again, that we wanna make sure that we are addressing in a timely manner while being fiscally responsible, which is essentially why we're looking for a pilot rather than an immediate long-term commitment. In the event that we find utility and ultimately the efficacy that we're looking for from one or more of these programs, from the feedback from the committee from next year, the idea would be at this time next year, there would be a proposal that includes a longer term commitment of three, four or five years. Again, we won't know that until we have the opportunity to pilot. And when we do pilot, this encompasses all grades, clearly as you can see here, all classrooms within all grades, not just one first grade teacher at Greenville, one first grade teacher at CLA Place, all first grade teachers, and so on and so forth. I had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, when looking at that glossary, Dibbles. This has been a seamless revisiting of this assessment which has truly given our teachers a tremendous amount of valuable data with respect to how our children in our district learn to read and what we can do to support them through explicit instruction. Part of what you don't see here is what the buildings budgeted for last year to also support the science of reading. That had to do with a continuation of foundations as far as word work and word study is concerned and also having decodables purchased at the building levels last year. And I know that our principals will be speaking to much of this when they present their proposals as well. Fun Hub in thinking about what's listed next under Dibbles is the platform, the digital platform that our teachers utilize as an opportunity for all kinds of instructional materials, resources and activities to embed to support literacy. It's a complement to Wilson language which ultimately is a direct correlation to what we already have in place with foundations. Think of it as an extension of foundations. The usage on this has been very high and our teachers are already asking, are we going to have this available to us for next year? Very, very important to note. 
The last item here is vocabulary their way. You'll notice it's for grade six. For grades three through five, Words Their Way, the sister program for word work and word study is something that is purchased through the building level principles. So you'll see that as part of their proposals. Here is the other large portion of the differential leading to that big ask. Our report cards presently are non-specific. They don't offer much. Here's what I can say to you in thinking about grades K through five. We're nearly a generation old. Our report cards were not customized at the time of development and adoption. They are 17 to 18 years old. It's time. It's time to update with Infinite Campus and ultimately have the same report card at both Greenville and Sealy Place schools for all grades. This is the opportunity to continue the fine work that our grade level teams, our committee members from last year and this year with administrative support can endeavor toward. This is a long, arduous process and I can see great results coming from it. What we envision happening here, if budget permitting, we're able to move forward is to continue the committee work and have Infinite Campus build these for us by the middle of next year so that we can take the spring and in a sandbox capacity, have the opportunity to explore how it really works. And if there are any further revisions, we can direct Infinite Campus to go ahead and make them so that in September of 2025, these would be in place for us for the 2025-2026 school year. You might be wondering, well, what about grade six? Grade six, we're working on presently. We have monies budgeted now to be able to put a new grade six report card in place at both Greenville and Sealy for this coming September, September of 2024. The reason why we chose to start with sixth grade, we are looking to emulate with the sixth grade report card, much of what the students receive here at grade seven and grade eight at Edgemont Junior Senior High School to build that bridge a little bit sooner as far as thinking about leaving Greenville and Sealy and transitioning to EHS. The price point for this you see, again, would be $90,000. Back in October, at this very podium, I had provided a presentation on two topics. One was Panorama, and the other was our Tri-State Consortium upcoming visit. We are looking to move in the direction of year two for Panorama next year. In the glossary, there was reference to the multi-tiered system of supports. We're looking to continue with this. We have found a tremendous amount of success now that the data integration is really moving in the direction that we needed to in looking at the coursework or academic data as well as the social and emotional learning data that we've yielded from some of the surveys that have been administered to students. In the presentation in October, earlier this year, I had indicated that we were looking at probably somewhere between a three to five year window for all in implementation across all four buckets. Those buckets being the academics or coursework, attendance, behavior, and the SEL or the social and emotional learning bucket. This year now that we are in 23-24, Greenville and Sealy Place Schools are focusing on the academics or the coursework bucket. Next year, we would like them to continue that focus, but add the other bucket of social and emotional learning. Similarly so, this year at EHS, we are focusing on social and emotional learning we would like to continue that focus here next year, but expand it and include the academics or the coursework bucket. So we're slowly building toward full implementation. And at the same time, it's important to share, even though you see that $52,000 there as a recurring cost, the idea behind all of this with full implementation is to have a view of the whole child, to see how every student in our district is faring specific to those four buckets, attendance, behavior, social and emotional learning, 
and the academics. Ultimately, that will inform what we celebrate and what we need to prevent or move in the direction of creating interventions for. Typically, we see annual BOCES services. We had a BOCES presentation at the board level not too long ago. And when we move toward the pie charts and the bar graphs included in the side-by-side -side at the end of my presentation tonight, you'll notice that BOCES has a pretty big chunk or portion of what I'm proposing for next year here for the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, which is from last year, also for next year. Just to walk through what you see, nothing different here from last year. This is a rollover as far as the actual services are concerned. The pricing was received through BOCES itself. In looking at frontline professional growth, this encompasses two particular components. One is professional development requests from staff members, and the other, this is where our staff evaluation process is nested. So if I were to go in and conduct an observation for a teacher and then type it up and issue it, this is where it's housed. And this is a function of a service provided by BOCES. Moving through to the New York State Data Collection, Frank Kammerher from Mr. Garofano's department, technology works very intensely as far as what we're required to report out on to the New York State Education Department. This is something that's a must have as far as having access to what's needed through BOCES to be able to submit those state reports in a timely manner. In looking at the two curriculum councils, these are essential networking opportunities for me as your assistant superintendent. It's also a hub for a lot of incredibly valuable information that I often find myself sharing with our administrative team. So this is certainly something that I would want to keep in the mix here in looking at these services for next year. Renaissance Star, we are presently administering across grades one through eight as a data point to track student achievement. This coincides with the data integration for Panorama and thinking about academics or that coursework bucket. We administer the assessments for both reading and mathematics. And that's something we'd like to continue to be able to do next year, which is why it's listed on this slide. Total price point here, $62,458. Each year, we would anticipate public school districts to include summer curriculum writing or curriculum writing to occur throughout the year, potentially beginning in the summer. What I can share with you here, in looking at that $53,589.78 is twofold. The first is that this figure is derived from the contractual hourly rate of $71.74, which means the Board of Education agreed upon an hourly rate when negotiating with our ETA. That is where that number comes from. The apportionment of the $53,589.78 is very much in sync or in tow with what we've typically seen happen each summer in our school district. Somewhere between $50,000 to $55,000 each year is what you would anticipate seeing from year to year as we maintain the appropriate programmatic and fiscal responsibility, keeping it pretty steady. What you see listed here in the way of all of these departments, whether it's K-12, 7-12, or 9-12, it does not necessarily mean that every single course for every single department year is going to be worked on. I have a separate list of all of those courses. It's quite extensive, as you can imagine. And again, it's based on need. If standards have changed, learning standards, as an example, that would be a key driver for working on this. I'll highlight library for a moment. We don't presently have anything for library. So our three librarians have been working very diligently this year on a number of tasks, part of which is being a liaison to the Student Research Committee that Cameron Brindice, our teacher resource specialist, is running. So we want to make sure that our librarians have the opportunity to create a trajectory that's seamless for our students, K through 12, so that all three libraries are stitched together in that regard. For social studies on the K to six side, 
thinking ahead that we would have a pilot of instructional materials and resources with Savis, Studies Weekly, and TCI. We clearly want to support teachers by having some kind of map for them to follow rather than just handing out materials and resources and saying, here, let us know how it goes. We want to identify some kind of scope and sequence to guide the work in the way of that implementation. Moving to ICAP, I just want to be very clear here so it's not at all misleading to anyone. This is not exclusive of the middle school ICAP program. The work for grades seven and eight, as far as thinking about curriculum mapping for ICAP, has already been completed this year with teachers and our teacher resource specialist. So again, $53,589.78 tied to the $71.74 per hour that's contractual and in line or in, in tow with what you've seen in prior years. On the professional development side of things, the first item listed, STI, this is familiar to us. We have maintained a membership with the Scarsdale Teachers Institute for a number of years now. Just note over to the side there, the price point for next year is $33,700. This is something I confirmed with the STI director about three weeks to a month ago. So that's firm. The other thing to highlight here in the way of professional texts, our two teacher resource specialists have been working diligently to grow our professional development libraries. And so as an example, last year, we picked up the six shifts tied to the science of reading. Our teacher resource specialists have been acquiring requests from teachers to purchase certain professional texts like that. So we wanna build in a little bit of a budget to be able to accommodate those requests and ultimately lead to even greater professional practices. APPR, each year, our administrators are required to be trained or retrained with APPR, so we bring in a consultant for that. The math you heard me to mention before, we're looking to secure a consultant or two to be able to support our K-6 teachers with mathematics instruction, specific to both math and focus, which is referenced in the glossary, as well as big ideas, the grade six program. The superintendent's conference days, we certainly don't want to come up short. We want to make sure that there's the opportunity to follow through with employing consultants from the perspective of being able to offer them the opportunity to be here on our four or at least a couple of our superintendent's conference days. So you see that total to 75,000. And then lastly here, just as a point of clarification, these particular conferences would be for me and would also be for the two teacher resource specialists. So as an example, Cameron and Anna this year, the teacher resource specialists have been very, very interested in participating in collegial circles, which you can envision throughout the entire region. A number of instructional coaches coming together for networking purposes has been extremely valuable to both of them. You can see here on this slide, $90,700. This is a rollover of the professional memberships that were budgeted for last year. The ASCD, the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development Learning Forward, and then the New York State Council of School Superintendents or NISCIS, these are memberships for the person standing right here right now, me. Continuation of those for me. When you look at the Tri-State Consortium membership, you heard me to mention we have a visit coming up. March 20th, 21st, and 22nd. This is a direct connection to our accreditation as a public school district, so it's pretty, pretty important. We wanna maintain our membership in that regard. This I confirmed with the present and soon to be outgoing director, Dr. Brooks. So that's 7850, part of the 10,000 is a true figure for next year for that membership. And so, that brings us to a personnel request that is not embedded in the ask. You see the note here not included in summary. This is in addition to everything I'm standing before you asking for. I find that I spend a great deal of my time on important clerical and organizational tasks that I could otherwise hand to a secretary or an assistant of some sort. And in turn, what that does 
is free me up to spend more time supporting principals, assistant principals, and all of the academia that's connected to our three schools. Very specific, EHS. I want to be able to give more of my professional time to supporting Mr. Hosier, his two assistant principals, and the staff in this particular school. That's not to say that I would be leaving Greenville and Sealy Place, not at all. There's only so much of me. So if I can hand some of the clerical work and the organizational work to a secretary or an assistant, I'll have more of me to work on the academia. And again, I would envision a lot of that time that would be freed up by having a secretary or an assistant to be geared towards supporting the Edgemont Junior Senior High School. Not at the sake of Greenville and Sealy, but in addition to, which makes the whole even stronger. These last two slides share the same information and data. It's just a matter of what's more visually appealing to you, meaning anyone who's looking at them. It's the same numerical information and data. This is truly a side-by-side -side of what I've proposed tonight with the exception of the secretary or assistant that I had just referenced for personnel with last year's budget, or what I should say is presently this year's budget. So 23-24 side-by-side -side with 24-25. And as I mentioned before, in one of the preceding slides, you'll notice BOCES takes up a lot of this. And I think that's a really good thing. A lot of it's aidable, as we know. And at the same time, it's connected to a larger purchasing network. And within that purchasing network are more people, which is very, very helpful to someone in my role. The other thing you'll notice is a significant portion earmarked for contractual and staff development. Things like the curriculum writing, the professional development. Again, those indirect or sometimes unseen parts of what truly drives making the goals of our district possible. At this point, that concludes what I intended to share tonight. I thank everyone for your time and attention. And if there are any questions, I will certainly address them. Okay, let's uh, start. You don't have to. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I, um, well, you can go first. I'll go after you. Um, oh, thank you for that, by the way. Um, very thorough, an enormous amount of work um, and responsibility. And um, so I appreciate this opportunity to just ask a couple of clarifying questions. Um, I guess I'll start with the new social studies program. I know you mentioned, you referenced the fact that obviously the materials that we're using are outdated. Beyond that, are there other gaps that you were trying to solve for when convening the committee to assess some of these new programs? Meaning, was is it just simply that the, 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 the texts and the content that we're using is outdated or were there also additional gaps that were that you were looking to solve for? One of the things that also became very clear very quickly is the need to have more culturally responsive texts when we look at our inventory. So what would ultimately happen in exploring these particular materials and resources is that specific to SAVIS, there are readers that accompany this particular program many of which meet that need. You'll also, as we start to explore this, hear me to say at future presentations or in other questions similarly asked, that we anticipate TCI and Studies Weekly will also help meet that need. That is something that definitely stands out and resonates in looking at these materials and resources. The other thing, just considering the idea of things being outdated, is how we're actually choosing to teach history, not necessarily the geographic components of all these program materials and resources, but the idea of having greater access to more diverse perspectives. And we anticipate that these resources will accommodate that when we think about things being outdated. Can I just piggyback on that since we're on the topic? Yes, I had another question. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just, in terms of that response, also been curious, the $45,000, is that, 
would that be anticipated as an annual fee or there's some upfront fixed costs associated with that that would for as a result or uh, sorry with respect to perhaps content that can then be so it depends on what direction we want to move in if we go with a three four or five year commitment then we'd be looking to incorporate that price point all in for next year's budget however what's important to share here is that specific to TCI and Studies Weekly, in part why those are so low, they might not appear low, why they are so low is because I was able to work with the vendors to get them to give us just about everything for free, digitally. Oh, and that material can be used going forward. The digital, we would purchase very likely the access for three, four or five years. The nice thing about that is that we'll be able to see the benefits of immediate updates in real time. The other portion having to do with controlling the cost here, two things come to mind. One is if we get to the point where the committee as it reconvenes and evaluates says we really like all of this, we try to focus more on the digital and less on the print. Studies Weekly though, one of the beauties of that particular set of resources, they're newspaper-like. So it gives you the feel of looking at news, an actual newspaper. So there's something to be said for that. And there's a user-friendly nature to it. And it brings us into the world of print and kind of moving away from the digital with a very nice balance here. The real question is, are we going to like the content as much as we envision that we may? So that's one way to control the costs, to go more with the digital. So if we envision, Price points for this for three, four, or five years at this time next year in this presentation, if much of it is digital, it should be lower than if something is print. On the print side, another way to get at this is to say to the vendors, we really would like you to help with the shipping cost on this, which is something I've done for a number of years. Shipping is ultimately determined by the vendor. If the vendor is open to going with a figure or a rate that is less on the shipping, that inures to our benefit. So that would help. Yeah, I mean, my question was more, was in the same line of the cost for print. Since it's a pilot, are we gonna be purchasing any textbooks that we won't necessarily be using if we're not happy with the no. implementation of these types of curriculum programs? No, so the idea of Savis, I'll use that as an example. We're not looking to purchase, let's say, 100 fourth grade textbooks, because very much to Noreen's point, if we decide next year, we don't really care for Savas, we don't want all these books sitting on the shelf, unused okay. for years. Good. Yeah, so I'm just trying to wrap my uh, head around the numbers that you, the big numbers that I mentioned. And uh, I did a calculation. Actually, the number comes to roughly $235 per student. And I was just wondering, that sounds like, is it good, more, less? Because that number doesn't sound too little to me on, on the space of it. Is that all we need to really upgrade the whole curriculum? It's just $235 per student for the whole year. I think, again, we're not going to know hmm. until we actually have the experience of the pilot itself. Hmm. And the idea here, again, is to be programmatically and fiscally responsible. We're not completely sold that this is going to work the way we want it to. So we certainly don't want to invest three or four or even five years of district dollars in that type of commitment. Got it. Well, I was just impressed how much we can achieve with the amount of work you're trying to do with that small amount per student. And uh, to me, I was really impressed by that number. So because I don't understand whether it's 400,000, 200,000, but for me, it's like how much did we actually spend per student? And that sounds pretty modest to me. Uh, I, was just... I would absolutely agree with you. I do think it's very modest. Just to put this in perspective, and I know we're trying to move in the direction of more digital, but if we were to purchase a physics textbook, yeah, that alone one hundred seventy-five dollars, two hundred dollars <laughs> landed, meaning it's yeah. in the classroom, right? That's just one book, one absolutely. student. This represents what the teachers will need. Everything. Everything. So very reasonable in that regard. And, and again, just to put this out there, I'm not shy talking to these vendors clearly. And at the same time, maintaining a, a professional relationship with them really helps. They're open-minded. And just a quirky fact, uh, you know, 
the CIS spends roughly two forty dollar per population in this country. So when you're doing CIE of two thirty five dollar per student, I'm just kind of pulling a small one here that it, it just sounds pretty modest to me. Again, we try to be fiscally responsible, and I, again, I found I found over the years in my experience developing the professional relationships with the representative from the company or whoever it happens to be that we're looking to purchase from, it really goes a long way. Thank you. Go. Go ahead, Speak a little bit um, about the report cards and how you anticipate them changing. Yes. So before I had mentioned for that particular slide, our report cards are nearly a generation old. They're 17 to 18 years old. At the time they were developed, a couple of things happened. The language on them, as far as the indicators or the categories that students would be graded on or scored on and then reported out on a quarterly or trimester basis, not standards-based or standards-aligned, again, very non-specific, very general. So we're looking to move in the direction of being standards-based or standards-aligned. So in fact, these new report cards will be much more specific. One of the things that also came about through the committee work is that Greenville and Sealy Place presently do not have the same report card for every grade. They're close, they're similar, but there are some subtle nuances that exist in the way of differences between the two. So we wanna close that gap as far as, again, thinking about alignment with progress monitoring or progress reporting for students on a trimester basis. The other thing that's become very important in the process to Heather's question, we plan on seeking input from parents and guardians before we finalize the report card. So right now we wanna continue the work with the teachers, come up with the drafts, convene a group of parents and guardians, like a focus group and say, could you kindly look at these? Tell us what makes sense. What would you benefit from learning more about? Should this language be changed a little bit? What would be helpful for us to consider under your advice? That's a key part of this process as far as thinking about what Heather is asking and something we wanna build into the mix. All right. Well, if that's it from the board, thank you, Dr. Bobbles. Uh, one thing. Oh, yep. Sorry, to make just a couple of comments. Um, one, I think we'll we'll see across both Paul's presentation tonight as well. Um, BOCES aid, we get 62.5% back on BOCES services. Not everything is aidable, but when you look at that slide that was approximately $65,000, all of those bolded items are aidable. So our actual net expenditure is, is really only about 35% of that. Um, Second thing, I think just to look at, and I think the last you were hitting on this point as well, although it's a 66% increase on these budget lines, you'll know we don't, we have not allocated a lot under the curriculum instruction lines over the past. In many years, we've just put those monies on the elementary school budgets or on the high school budget. It was never really under CNI, um, but more programmatically under each building. Um, that increase of 183,000 represents about a 0.3% increase to the budget. So it's so in terms of like total materiality, I think to Lesh's point that it's a 66% on Dr. Bobble's lines, but it's only 0.3% increase on the whole. Yeah, and that that was actually, um, thanks because that, that was something I was looking at. You know, it's it, I appreciate the work that went into building this budget in the defense rounds, because obviously we don't want to be spending money. We don't have to. But if you look at $183,000 in this overall scheme of the budget, you know, it's a 66% increase because you're talking relatively small numbers. And so it, it's, you know, not overall, not that much, um, but thank you. Of course. And uh, we're now ready for Technology. Technology. All right. Bring us home, Paul. I'm going <laughs> to give you the 9 p.m. version. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I am Paul Garifano, uh, Director of Technology, Steam Coordinator, Data Protection Officer. Uh, before I start, I want to recognize and congratulate uh, Jonathan Espinosa, who at the conclusion of tonight's meeting, I uh, will receive a promotion to be our first network administrator in the district. So I want to congratulate you.
much of the accomplishments uh, that go into or come from our department, Jonathan really has a hand in. So uh, well earned and well deserved. Congrats, John. Okay, that being said, let's dive into the 24-25 technology budget proposal. I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna end here. Uh, we're looking at a modest 3.8 increase on the uh, technology budget for next year. And we'll take a quick look at that. Uh, every year I do this exercise around what I hear, what I see and uh, the technology budget, like all of our budgets, are really built over the course of the year. Uh, they happen in the classroom, talking to teachers, talking to staff, talking to students, working with our partners at the Lyric. Um, I'm fortunate enough to participate in a lot of regional and national organizations. So a lot of conversations and thinking goes into the technology budget. And um, I'll illustrate that tonight. So we're always thinking about today, but we're always preparing for the future. Some of the um, items that we're always thinking about and preparing for are around our wireless network, uh, device refresh cycle, uh, keeping up with our core server, making sure that our infrastructure is up to date, but at the end of the day, making sure that our staff, our teachers, and most importantly, our students have reliable, equitable access all the time, anywhere. Uh, this is the 2022-25 technology plan, which expires at the end of next year. Like all other technology directors, I will engage uh, with the Lyric in New York State and we will update that plan. But as you can see, really the tenets of the plan are around uh, instructional technology, are involving infrastructure, infrastructure, digital citizenship, staff support, cybersecurity. And there's a link there when it is posted. If you have the luxury of time and want to read through the entire thing. Uh, okay, so before we take a look at um, the proposed projects for the upcoming budget, just want to take a quick look at uh, what's going on now, what's happened this year and what we're working on. Uh, we are finally done with our network interoperability um, initiative, and in some, this provides a lot of security um, on the front end and on the back end. So it links up with our student information system for students and our financial system for staff. And really, uh, which Jonathan can certainly attest to, it provides a fail state. So when new students or staff are coming in, it equips them with all the access they need. And new staff and or students leaving the district, it removes that access. So it's really become an integral part of our workflow, not just for our department, but for the district as a whole. Um, our K-6 classroom workstation upgrades are done. All of our K-6 classrooms, we've removed the traditional PC desktop setup, and we've equipped uh, every classroom with a mobile uh, high-powered Chromebook that gives the teacher not only greater access to resources, but flexibility in the classroom. So they're not tethered to the front of the room. They can take the device and move about the room. And I think you'll find if you speak to most of our K-6 teachers, they're really happy with the new setup. They also have more desk space. Um, our K-4 Chromebook upgrade work uh, refresh schedule, we're a little ahead of this. We were gonna start shipping away the kindergarten Chromebooks next year, but, uh, Thanks to Jonathan, we're ahead of schedule. So uh, this, will be, this refresh cycle will be completely done probably in the fall. Uh, we're just putting final, um, uh, the final parts into our upgrade to our network connectivity. This has been a huge project undertaking with a number of vendors and our partners at the Lyric. So essentially we're going from a garden hose to a fire hose. We're increasing our network from one gigabyte to 10 gigabyte. And that goes back to having that real time, all time reliable access for all of our staff and our students. Simultaneous to that, a couple of months ago, the internet went down for like three hours and a lot of us were, what do we do? <laughs> we don't have the internet. So we put in what's called a redundant line back to Rockland Bosey. So if and when the internet does go down, it's kind of like a brownout. We'll still have internet connectivity. We won't be running on um, all cylinders, but we will still maintain internet connectivity. So 
uh, let's say the primary aspects of instruction can still happen. So that's been a pretty big undertaking that we've just about that. Okay, so um, just taking a look at the district technology overview, um, technology integration really is at the forefront, uh, going back to district goal component three, purposeful instruction, powerful connections uh, to learning the world around, right? The integration of technology needs to be meaningful, not just teaching technology for the sake of teaching technology. And I think you'll find in all of our classrooms, that's what our teachers are doing. That's how our students are learning to use technology with purpose. Here are three really great fun examples. Again, when the presentation um, is public, I implore you to take a look at any one of these three examples from our green screen interviews that some of our elementary grade levels are doing to our explorers web design that our um, fifth and sixth graders are doing and these making global connections, the um, our world language program students made books using the application Canva uh, that are bilingual. I think Mr. Chesterson uh, spoke a little bit about it last year, but prior to their trip to the Dominican Republic. Well, they made these books and they're bringing them and they're gonna be reading them to children in schools in uh, the DR uh, when they go. They just went, they just went. <laughs> right. They just went over with the break. So again, uh, here's just a, a snapshot, but these types of projects are happening all over Edgewood. It's really exciting. And again, that goes back to the meaningful, purposeful use of technology for learning. And I clicked on the links and they're really cool. Oh, you already looked at them? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're all great. I got a chance to kind of look at the books a little bit more in depth today and they're just, wow. They're like professional, but they're really great. Um, our STEAM program, I had done a, a presentation with some of our STEAM teachers in the fall, but just a quick overview. The program grows, it's been hugely successful. Um, you know, when I walk into one of our STEAM classrooms at the junior, senior high school, it's a great learning environment. Students are up, they're moving, there's collaboration. Uh, they're working on really dynamic 21st century projects. Um, we are now piloting, right? The goal has always been keep growing the STEAM program. Let's make sure that all of our students are afforded the opportunity to be uh, part of this program. So we're now piloting uh, in our K-6, uh, in our K-6 STEAM program, uh, a program called Skillstruck. And it's computational thinking, it's computer science. We're piloting it in our fifth and sixth grade. And I hope to, if not at the end of this school year, hopefully in the fall, give an update on that. But the goal is to, it seems to really be gaining traction to roll that out throughout our elementary schools. Um, a brief breakdown of seed program expenditures, budgetary wise, most of it is in equipment and resources. We have a lot of consumables in our STEAM program. So in fact, I've been doing inventory for next year with our STEAM teachers. Uh, that's really where most of uh, the expenditure and on May 21st, Edgemont presents our first annual STEAM Fair. Uh, we're really excited about it. We've had over 50 entries and applications. Um, this year, we're, we're limiting it to 6th through 12th grade. Uh, that was really on the advice of the elementary school teachers. They wanted to just kind of dip their toe in the water with 6th graders. But we have over 50 entries. And we have these uh, mentor workshops that are happening after school where some students who need help kind of actualizing their projects, but it's, uh, it's really shaping up to be an exciting event and there'll be more to come on that, but it's gonna be on May 21st, right here on our panther. Um, quick overview of what the typical Edgemont classroom looks like from our access points to our one-to-one -one Chromebooks, centralized printing, uh, there's a lot of technology and there's a lot of upkeep and you know, I'm really grateful that we have such a hardworking technology department because they're really responsible for maintaining all of this. When I started in Edgemont, I think we had a total of 100 laptops, forget about Chromebooks, and now we're well over managing well over 2,000 Chromebooks or Chrome bases and uh, you know, we've got quite, quite a lot of technology to manage on the daily basis. So we have a service desk and it gets, you know, a lot of use. And uh, every year uh, I like to point out that um, the business duration, so, you know, how long it takes to resolve a ticket in our staff of five or four 
Um, almost 90% of the tickets are, are resolved the same day. And again, that's a testament to the skill set and the hard work uh, of the folks in our technology department, Jonathan included. Um, Andrea Nash is our K-12 instructional technology specialist. On any given day, uh, you'll find Andrea co-planning with teachers, co-teaching in the classroom. And she's really right at the forefront of that meaningful, purposeful integration of technology into teaching and learning. She does an unbelievable job, uh, you know, being one uh, teacher in, you know, throughout our, our K-12 district. These are just some statistics. We get a high, as Dr. Bobble has mentioned, um, you know, we really do accentuate and focus and understand how we're using instructional technology, whether it's uh, you know, digital book resource, reading resources, uh, or math resources, or social studies resources. We integrated Google however many years ago. It really, we are a true Google district. Our statistics are through the roof. And, you know, you'll find that the workflow from students to teachers to staff, and, you know, and these numbers kind of actualize that. Uh, our professional learning on a year-to-year -year basis is around our uh, PD workshops and conference days. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, professional development. We have our lunch and learns that uh, Andrea Nash facilitates. Um, we partner, uh, our partner with the Lear. We have a model schools program, and of course, the Scarsdale Teachers Institute. Okay, so now we're back. So the <laughs> modest 3.8%, what is included in that increase? Um, like many of our departmental budgets, we have a lot of services that come through BOCES. Uh, the other breakdown is around uh, our student information system, our STEAM program uh, equipment kind of comes in second place to BOCES, as we do have quite a bit of equipment to buy year to year. Breaking that down, there really aren't any major fluctuations. Maybe the one fluctuation here is we had a little bit more expenditures this year. Um, on our core server that we don't have next year, but otherwise uh, everything is pretty even, Stephen. What are those Lyric services for the technology department? Um, we have one full-time Lyric employee, Evan Botiglieri, who works here. He's part of our managed um, IT field support. We get a lot of services from our internet, our wireless model schools, um, software services, and our installment purchase agreement for BOSIS. What are the big ticket items for the 24-25 budget? Again, Lyric services. Um, we always buy uh, new Chromebooks for our incoming fifth graders as part of our sixth year of our one-to-one -one program. Uh, so that's been hugely successful. We're buying, uh, we need to upgrade all of the admin and clerical PCs. It's been a number of years kind of putting, you know, updating the RAM and kind of putting band-aids on them, but they need to be replaced. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to, what we've done at the elementary schools with our teacher workstations, getting rid of the traditional desktops, we'll be putting those, um, high powered Chromebooks into all of our high school classrooms over the summer, early fall, um, our K-12 instructional technology applications, of course, our student information system, our SEAM program, some of our web services, which include our website. Uh, ClassLink, which is our single sign-on platform. Uh, we always have consumables in our department around folks and Max. Jonathan is a certified uh, technician, so we don't have to send our devices out anymore. Jonathan actually repairs everything on site, which not only saves money, it saves time. And that's been a, a huge plus. So finally, uh, we have two installment purchase agreements, which is just another way of saying leases or uh, loans that we have through the Lyric. And um, they, what they do is kind of offset the year to year. Um, one, which will come off the books, you can't see it because that makes that the pop up windows there, but um, one will uh, come off the books or be paid off uh, at the end of next school year. And that would for Promethean panel upgrades throughout the district. And one we took on last year. And that was for some of the uh, refresh, uh, for the second and third year Chromebooks, and some of the new uh, workstation upgrades. And Paul Garifano, no, I don't. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any questions from the board? This, this one question that I really highlighted. Um, there were an input that the technology becomes such an important and critical part of current times. Is there anything from a very large picture or big vision perspective that you think is something like you and decide something now, three years down the line that you don't do it? Is any kind of a real big, hairy kind of a vision? That you I think we're there uh, in that we're just wired, you know, moving away from the, the, the tethered technology. Um, and beyond that, I think we're headed to holograms and chips inserted, uh, you know, in our in our mainstream. But at, for for the purposes of 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 an educational organization, a wireless is at. So that's why you know one of the slides I talked about always thinking ahead. It's it's maintaining our infrastructure, and that's why we just moved from the one gigabyte connection between the buildings and back to our service providers to ten. So always thinking about, you know, in five years, are we going to have to go from 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 um, and having, you know, fail safes in place like the redundant line that we put in so that we're spending all this money on hardware and making everything wireless. But if you don't have the infrastructure there, it's no good. So I think, you know, jokes aside to answer your question, it's it's always providing, maintaining, but thinking ahead to have an infrastructure that's going to support the technology and artificial intelligence, but that's a whole nother conversation and presentation. <laughs> Did you have anything to add, Brian? Okay. All right, okay. well, thank you. Uh, so that brings us to the consent portion of our agenda. Are there, is there anything anyone wants to take out of order? <clears throat> All right. It's a recommendation of the superintendent of the board approve the following recommendations by consent vote. Personnel matters I-1 through I-20, which includes leaves of absences, resignations, probationary appointments, leave replacements, student activity advisors and chaperones. Student matters J-1 and J-2, Committee on Preschool Special Ed and the Committee on Special Education and business items K-1 through K-23, which includes budget transfers, authorization to trans, um, Authorization to transfer these funds, authorization to enter into various ind uh, independent consultant contracts, authorization to form new student clubs, authorization to enter various agreements, including consultants for student programming, BOCES cooperative bidding programs, and agreement with the County of Westchester to use voting machines for the May 21st, 2024 school budget and school board election, trustee election. May I have a motion? Heather, second Doyer. Yes, sir. I'll make two comments. So first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Manager for uh, putting the calendar from a very diversified population perspective. So the community should notice that we have taken in consideration uh, a lot of the public holidays, uh, festival holidays for the diverse community that we have. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Uh, second is, uh, my usual club, thank you. And uh, we talk about technology and all that, and we have a crochet and a knit club, and which I get is quite relaxing. <laughs> so thank you, this, that is Tino and Miss Amorosa, and a meteorology club. I would like to thank Miss Lavadula for taking initiative to all of these club steward Thank you. Thank you much. Um, I also wanted to make just a quick note about the calendar. Um, if you're old school like me, you're going to see 180 days and wonder about snow days. There is time built in. If we have a snow day, we don't eat into the um, August, uh, April vacation. The other thing I wanted to note on the calendar, um, as Nilesh noted, we have included a number of uh, additional holidays, some of which are uh, now official state holidays, some of which we have included out of the spirit of inclusivity. What you will not see on the calendar, however, are things like Easter. And that is because uh, this calendar is not listing holidays that are already within a vacation. So if it's not affecting the calendar, we haven't listed it, if that makes sense. Or, or, or on a weekend, thank you, yes. Um, so it's it's not, it, it just was starting to get too crowded if we listed everything that was already accounted for 
by being already a day off. So um, wanted to explain that. The other thing I just wanted to note, um, Ray, I'm really impressed by the uh, 1998 trucks that <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a testament to our facilities department, keeping things running that long. So anyway, with that, um, all in favor? All right, the consent agenda has passed. Uh, our next board meeting will be on Thursday, two days from now, February 25th. <laughs> there is no planned executive session, so the meeting will begin with public business at 7 p.m., where we expect to have additional presentations from various departments and schools about next year's budget. Then next week, we have another board meeting on Tuesday, March 5th, to continue our conversations about the budget on is this right? Oh, okay. On March 7th, we have our final bond forum <laughs> to answer community questions about any aspect of the bond, including the financial elements that we discussed this evening. Uh, that will be in the auditorium at 7 p.m. We look forward to seeing everyone at the next meeting, and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>